Last week we finished our series uh, on the high priestly prayer of Jesus and we saw how Jesus prioritized unity in his prayer to his father. Uh, he prayed for unity, that it would exist amongst his disciples that he was leaving behind. And then he prays for the unity of the church afterwards, obviously uh, throughout the centuries, right up until uh, you and I today. And so we see that, that unity is a, is a priority for Jesus. And what's a priority for Jesus needs to be a mandate and a command for the church. We talked about the importance of, of uniting around the right things, right? The church tends to get divided when we seek to unify around politics or uh, geography or social issues or, or whatever. What ends up happening is when the church seeks to unify around those things, it, become, it, become, it creates division. We were never intended to unite around those things. We are called to unite around that which is essential, that which connects our, our today to our past, right? So what unites us as a church with the church um, 500 years ago is our shared faith in the essentials of the gospel. What unites us with the churches around the world today is our shared faith in the essentials of the gospel. And so it's something we need to be really careful to maintain because again, it was a priority for Jesus and it creates an effectiveness for the church and unity creates a platform or a stage for maturity. Spiritual maturity is God's plan for the church. It's God's desire for the church. And that's the, kind of, that's the subject we're going to look at in these next number of weeks as we uh, look at this idea of the pursuit of maturity, the pursuit of spiritual maturity. It's actually, it flows very well following our awareness of our need for unity. Now, as we recognize what we need to hold on to, now it's this commitment to pursuing maturity. We're going to take a look at a portion of a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 4 as one of our primary texts. Uh, we probably won't get there today. Um, but, but we see that the church at Philippi was very dear to the heart of the Apostle Paul. Some have even concluded that the church at Philippi was Paul's favorite church of all the churches that he planted. Now, I don't know if Paul is allowed to have a, a favorite church, it's kind of like a parent saying they got a, a favorite kid. They're not, you're not like, at least you don't verbalize it, right? You're not supposed to, like you, you're supposed to love them all the same, right? And, and you might like them differently. Um, but no, I'm kidding. We like them all and love them all the same. But, um, but, it, but there's enough there that suggests that there was, a, there was a very special relationship between the Apostle Paul and the church at Philippi. There was a, a shared commitment to the ministry that God in, in, um, entrusted into Paul's hands. And, and they were engaged not only in his ministry, but in his life. And so there's a real heart um, between, that exists between Paul and the church at Philippi, Philippi. And as we get into the readings of Paul and what he writes to the church at Philippi, it's a call to maturity. It's a call to, to embrace uh, and thrive in their walk with Jesus. Because as any good shepherd, which Paul was, you want to see your congregation thrive. You want to, you want to see allegiance to the King of Kings, love to the King of Kings, and a, and a passionate growth and a passionate love for Jesus. That's our, that's our mission here at the church, right? To inspire people to passionately follow Jesus, right? That's what we want to see take place. And, and so Paul reaches out to the, to the church at Philippi, and, and we see that, that he calls them to spiritual maturity, now, because of, because of Paul's own journey, he recognized that, that thriving in our spiritual walk, in our spiritual maturity, it requires intentionality on our part. There's a, there's a process to spiritual maturity. You, you don't just wake up one day and be like, I know I'm just going to be spiritually mature. Don't you wish it was that easy? <laughs> right? Like, done, you know, microwave, boom, boom. I'll have spiritual maturity uh, today. Um, no, it, it's a process. And, and, and the end game of spiritual maturity on this side of eternity 
is that we would influence people for Jesus Christ. And in the end of the day, we exist to glorify God. And I, and I get that. But, the, but really, the way in which we glorify God in the world today is that we influence people for Jesus. That is what we are called. We are the salt of the earth, Jesus said, right? We're the, the light of the world. We are to influence the world around us, not with our agenda, but with the agenda of Jesus, with the love and life of Jesus. We are to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world around us. And so Jesus, when ascending into heaven, he didn't say, go, go make converts because we can't make converts. But instead he said, go make disciples. Go make influencers. Go into all the world and make disciples. And you see, if we want to be an influencer for Jesus, if we want to be someone who can influence others the way we are called and designed to do, then that means that we first need to take a look, in, uh, take an inward look and commit to our own spiritual growth because you can't give what you don't have, right? And so we need to be intentional about that very thing. I heard a quote um, uh, way back and, and uh, I shared in the first service, for the life of me, I, I don't know where, uh, who, who said this, um, I searched the internet high and low and, and I see the, I see the wording of it, but I, I, I didn't see anybody own it. So I'm going to claim it as my own this morning. Um, <laughs> now it, it's, it's certainly something that I didn't have the tools to come up with, but, but it's very interesting. If you happen to find it or you know it, please let me know because my curiosity is a little bit stoked, but, but they talk about this, this idea of there being a process to spiritual maturity, right? And they say pr- maturity proceeds through four stages. There's four stages that, that bring somebody to maturity. And then the first one is this stage of help me, help me. The second one is tell me. The third one is show me. And the last one is follow me, help me. Tell me, show me, and follow me. Help me says that I am aware that I have a need. You see, you'll never grow unless you recognize that you have a need. And so the first posture is this this posture that says, help me. And the second one is, tell me. It's an awareness that that I need to be informed. I need to be instructed. I don't know everything that I need to know. So I need help and I need somebody to instruct me, somebody to tell me. Now that writes off a lot of people right there because nobody wants to be told what to do. Nobody wants to appear weak or uninformed or or requesting help. And and the reality of it is those who don't recognize their need for help and they're not willing to listen, they retard their growth. They hinder their ability to, to mature and they become very ineffective. In fact, they can become counterproductive in the kingdom of God. Help me, tell me, and then it's show me. Show me recognizes the awareness to be, show show me, let me watch you do it. Let me watch you, let me observe your life. Let me see how you have applied what you have been taught and let me watch you. And then it's follow me. Follow me is an awareness that, that now that you've been through this process, now it is your responsibility, my responsibility to now go help and tell and show others so that they might grow as well. Help me, tell me, show me, and follow me. And let me tell you, there's no, there's no shortcuts. I mean, I've met people that, that, that they want to start off with follow me. Have you met them? They don't want to go through a process. They don't want to submit to authority. They don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to go through a process where they watch others and learn They just want to step right up and be the leader. Follow me. And what ends up happening is those things usually die on the vine. But the downside is it really affects a lot of people who are trying to follow them. And so this is a process that we need to be willing to go through. In fact, even the Apostle Paul went through a process like this. I mean, the Apostle Paul didn't just start off as the Apostle Paul. 
Before we, before we were introduced to the great apostle Paul who started churches and, and wrote three quarters of the New Testament and, and was brought up into the, to the third heavens and, and we see all the, the wonderful uh, things that the apostle Paul experienced, before he was that guy, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was a Pharisee who was bent on persecuting the church of Jesus Christ. He had one mission, it's to stop this movement of Jesus' followers. And he imprisoned and, and tortured and, and was even at the, he was even at the murder of the first, our, our, the first martyr, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. Paul was there, Saul was there. So he wasn't always the great apostle Paul, but he, he went through a process. And we see this process take place in Acts chapter 9. If you want to take a look at that. Um, so Saul in verse one, he's still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, right? He goes to the high priest and he asks him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that he'd have permission to go and find those who belong to the way. The way is this movement of Jesus followers. That's what they were known as at this point. He asked for a letter to go and find those who are part of that group, men or women, so that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem, arrest them. But while he was on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. I love this. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? We see right from the beginning, Paul finds himself in a position of needing help. Here he is on one mission and now he's on the floor. He hears... This voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul recognized, or Saul recognized, that he was in need of help. And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So now we see Paul moves from help me to now tell me, who are you, Lord? Right? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. Could you imagine the face on Saul? He'd be like, really? Got that one wrong. And look, he says, look, rise and enter the city and you will be told what to do. We see, help me. We see, tell me. And then look in verse seven. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing nobody. Imagine being on that trip. That was, must have been very um, unsettling but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. And so they led him by hand and brought him to Damascus. And now we see that first we see, help me, we see, tell me, and now they are showing him how to get from where he is to where God wants him to be. They are now heading into Damascus. And while these first three steps happen pretty quickly, at least in this, in this text, the the Apostle Paul will spend the next several years being helped, being told, being shown. And in God's timing, he would raise up as the great Apostle Paul who will say to the church at Corinth, follow me as I follow Christ. But he'd been through a process Help me, tell me, show me, and then follow me. And what's true for the Apostle Paul is true for every one of us. There's a process that is necessary for, for a Christian to go through so that we might experience the fullness of what God has designed for us to do. Maturity is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. It's not a pill you take and you wake up mature. Justification is a free gift from God through Jesus Christ. Because of what Christ did for me on the cross, there is nothing I can do to add to that work. All I do is I surrender, I apply what Christ did as my only means of salvation, and I am as justified, I am as saved as I will ever be. I am reconciled back to God. I have done nothing to achieve that, and, and Christ has, has done it all. 
Amen? I mean, we've been recipients of that. However, now it's time for me to grow a little bit. Now it's time for me to take what I've received and I don't need to add to that, but I need to respond to that. I need to take that which I've received and out of a heart of love, now pursue this one who came and lived and died for me. And that's gonna take a little, bit of, a little bit of inspiration and a whole bunch of perspiration. I'm gonna to have to work at this. Again, not to stay saved, but because I have been saved, because of what he has done for me, my posture is now to pursue the lover of my soul and to grow into being all that Christ designed for me to be. How many want to be everything that Christ has designed you to be? I mean, I, I, want to, I, want, I want to hear those words, not anytime soon, but I want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. I want to, I want to make God proud, just like I know you do. And if, and if I want to do that, it requires five things that I want to highlight to you. And perhaps I'm sure there's others, but just five that I want to highlight to you this morning. Some, some mindsets that are necessary in order for us to position ourselves into being and growing in maturity so that we can be an effective tool of God's hands. The first thing is it requires intentionality. Intentionality. We must purpose in our hearts to grow spiritually. It's got to be something that we, we go after. We recognize that it doesn't happen just because we attend a church. It doesn't happen just because we know other Christian people. It doesn't happen just because we're around other Christian people. We must be intentional about our pursuit, about our spiritual growth. Number two, it takes prioritization. It must become a priority in our lives. And the only way you will discover what you prioritize is by taking a moment of pause and examining your life, right? We can say what we prioritize all we want, but the only way we'll really be able to define what we prioritize is to take a moment of pause and to look at our life. That means that what we do is we take a moment of pause and we consider if there's anything in our life that's keeping us, keeping me from growing in my walk with Jesus, is there anything that's distracting me from following Christ? And if there's something distracting me or keeping me from pursuing my spiritual growth, I either need to remove it or I need to put healthier boundaries around it so that it doesn't get in my way. Because listen, not every distraction is a bad thing. Hey, your marriage could be a distraction. Your kids could be a distraction. Your job can be a distraction. Your friends can be a distraction. So I'm not encouraging anybody to put away their, their marriage. Excuse me. I'm not looking for anybody to put away their kids or their job. But sometimes we need to make sure that we, we put some healthy boundaries around those things so that Christ becomes first. And listen, when Christ becomes first, your marriage will thrive. When Christ becomes first, you'll be a more effective employee or employer or a more faithful friend or a more faithful whatever. When Christ is first, everything else finds its proper place. It requires intentionality. It requires prioritization. Thirdly, it requires humility. It requires humility. It's recognizing our sincere need to grow. It's recognizing our dependence upon God. Man in his sinful nature seeks to be independent from God. We see that in Satan. We see that in Adam and Eve in the garden. And we see that all in humanity. And while our nature may have changed at the cross, we have learned some ways over the years that, that, that still seeks at times to be independent from God. Humility, and, and that which creates pride, by the way. 
Humility recognizes our full dependence upon God. He is the vine, I am the branches. Without him, I, I can do nothing. And so to be all that we've been designed to be, it requires intentionality, it requires prioritization, it requires humility, and number four, it requires community. It requires community. Embracing the body of Christ, the gift of God to one another and through one another. There's a reason why Paul likens us to a body. Because no one part of the body is any less significant than any other part. You, we, we all mutually need one another. If the smallest part of my body gets cancer, it's going to completely affect my whole body. And so Paul likens the church to a body. And God designed us in such a way that we thrive when we're in community with one another. And as I mentioned, or as I mentioned in the first service, that means that we just need to be a little creative on how that needs to go, happen in these, late, these last days, right? I mean, there's been some challenges, there's been some obstacles that have prevented us from being able to engage in community the way we want. So that doesn't mean we throw that out. That means that we just become more creative on how we're gonna connect with one another, how we're gonna fellowship with one another, how we're gonna pray with one another. Community is one of the means of God's grace in our life. It's the way in which God enables us to be healthy and thrive. And then fifthly, we must have, all that we do must flow from a heart of love and not religious obligation. All that we do must flow from a heart of love and not religious obligation. Religious obligation always leads to relational disappointment. Religious obligation always leads to relational disappointment. That means that if you are doing your spiritual disciplines of, of reading your Bible and praying and, and connecting with people solely out of a religious posture, you are going to be disappointed in your relationship with God because you're doing those things as a means of your relationship with God and not as a, as, as a response to your relationship with God. Religion is us pursuing, religion is us uh, taking the initiative to pursue God. Relationship is God taking the, taking the initiative and pursuing us. Redemption is God initiating what we need. And I don't know about you, but I've seen, and we've, and we've all seen that, right? When someone approaches God from a religious affect, they're short, and I don't mean in stature, I mean with people, right? They're, they're, there's just no patience, they're, they're critical, they're frustrated, they're quick to anger. Why? Because they're, they're just not settled. Everything we do needs to flow out of a love for Christ. I read the word because I love him. I pray because I love him, I fellowship because I love him. And it's what fuels this relationship that I have been invited to experience with my Savior. There's just a couple of things. Now, now, before that freaks anybody out, because before you kind of disqualify yourself and, and say, I don't, I don't know if I can pull that off. The good news is that the, that the Holy Spirit is the one who will work alongside you in that journey. You're not left alone. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, it's good that I go away because if I don't go away, the helper, when I go away, the helper will come and he, he will not walk with you like I did, but he, he will be in you. And he will lead you into all truth. And, and so the Holy Spirit is now with us and, and he is working with us. Well, let, me, let me just kind of throw this out there. Where my efforts stop and where the Holy Spirit's efforts kick in in my growth, I don't think I'll ever fully understand on this side of eternity. I just won't. I don't know where my efforts stop and when the Holy Spirit's kind of kick in. I just kind of, I just kind of do it this way. I just kind of live my life like it all depends on me. And I sleep at night knowing that it's the Holy Spirit who's at work in my life. 
Because I, I don't know, I don't know where it starts and, and where it stops. It's very interesting. Paul addresses something to the church at Philippi earlier on in, 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 in this letter that I kind of want to bring to your attention before we jump into chapter four. Philippians chapter one and verse six, Paul says this, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great news? He that began the work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. What an encouraging word from God to that one that's discouraged and feeling, I don't measure up, I don't meet the standard, I'll never be accepted. No, no, he who began a good work in you, he will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I'm sure the readers that heard that for the first time just dropped their shoulders and just said, thank God. But then he says something very interesting in chapter two, verse 12, he says, now work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What? It's like, yeah, yeah here's what you do. Just, you just work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Good, good luck with that. I'm heading up. Imagine that's all that was said. I mean, it's very interesting, the contrast between these two things, but thankfully it doesn't stop right there. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So we see this amazing contrast that we're being introduced here. Same audience, it's still the church of Philippi. Same author, it's still Paul that's writing this. But on the surface, it appears to be conveying completely different messages. It's God who will complete the work. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do. What is going on here? These scriptures are not in conflict with each other, but rather they're different sides of the same coin. It goes back to what I said before, where my working out my own salvation ends and God working in me kicks in, I have no idea. I don't know. But I do know this, that he who began that work, he's gonna complete it. And I do have the opportunity, even more so than the responsibility, I do have the opportunity to pursue him for my spiritual growth. I live my life like it all depends on me, but I sleep at night knowing that he who began a good work in me, he'll complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. They are, they are, they are, they are two tensions, that, that two truths that, that create a tension that you can't let go of either one of them. Because if you, let, if you let go a little bit of working out your own salvation, you're in error. If you let go of the fact that God is the one who does the work, you're in error. These two truths must be held tightly together without the desire or the need to feel like we need to reconcile that on this side of eternity. We need to embrace it as two sides of the same coin and pursue him. We don't have the resources in our makeup to enact spiritual maturity in our lives. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. However, we are to put in motion that which we do as an act of obedience, as an act of worship. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit will take our efforts and motions and bring them further than our efforts ever could. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you ever have those moments where you feel like, I, I really need to be in the word? What's going on there? It is God at work in you, right? It is the Holy Spirit saying, why don't you spend some time in the Word? I want to show you something. I want to help you. I feel like I need to pray today. I just, what, what's going on there? It is God at work in you. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about this, this theme of pursuing maturity. And I and I pray with all my heart that you see this as an invitation to blessing. That you see this as an opportunity. 
and not some insurmountable hurdle that just kind of feels like homework. I hate homework. I always did. I'm like, man, I put my day in. I should be able to get home and do what I want to do, right? And I know most teachers are thinking, well, that's a problem. But I'll let you deal with that. What I'm highlighting to you is not homework. It's, a, it's an opportunity to engage with the God of the universe, the one who made you, the one who loves you, and the one who invites you to a deeper walk with him. And so as we engage in this, our mindset going into it is very important. If we look at it as, oh man, I'm going to feel like a loser, then you know what? You're missing the point. What we're invited to do is to see what does the word of God say about how we can grow as followers of Jesus Christ so that we could please God and honor God and make him proud. It's something that we need to be intentional about. It's something we need to prioritize. It's something that we need to know um, that we, we have this need for community and humility. We need to pursue this not as a religious effort, but with a passionate heart for God. It's an invitation to be a better reflection of the Lord, the one who saved us, the one who loves us, because that's the essence of what we're called to do, right? Right? I mean, I know about you, but I wear a lot of hats, right? Think about all the hats you have to wear. On the job, you probably have different roles. and home, you have different roles and all your different relationships, right? All, we all wear these different hats. And we have to be, in a sense, different things to different people because that's just the environment we find ourselves in. But what, what is the essence of discipleship? What is the essence, essence of, of maturity? What's it really kind of get down to? It's really, ultimately, we're called to be a reflection of Jesus, in the world around us. That means that the influence of Jesus needs to affect every one of those hats that we wear. Any one of those, every one of those people that we influence needs to be an extension of the way in which we have been influenced by Christ. That's ultimately what we're called to do. My prayer for our church is the same as my prayer for myself, that, that we'd grow in our walk with Christ that we would pursue spiritual maturity because that is what will guard us from error. That is what will guard us from, from being prideful. That is what will guard us from sin and that is what will enable us to love God more, to love one another more and to love the lost more to whom we're called to influence for Christ. I think of the sad commentary, there is commentary that is, that is said to the audience in the book of Hebrews. Paul just lays out this, this incredible truth bomb in chapter five. And then he follows up that truth bomb in verse 11. And he says, we have much to say about this. And it's hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, but you're not, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from, e from evil. What hard words that must have been for them to hear. I mean, there's an incredible audience to whom the writer of Hebrews is writing. There's, there's two, actually, there's probably three kinds of people that are in that audience. There's, there's certainly Christians that are growing, right? But there's also Christians there uh, or people that are there that they really, they kind of bought into the community of Christ, but they didn't buy into the Christ of the community. They hadn't embraced Jesus, but they loved this whole movement and this whole community you know, thing that was going on. And so they were, they were a part of the church. They just weren't like really part of Christianity. They had, a, they had a profession of faith, but not a possession of faith. And so he is addressing that group of people also, namely in chapter six. But there's also this other group that had been around, but they just kind of kind of flat. They just, they embraced Christ, they accepted Christ, but they hadn't grown. They got locked on the milk. 
They stopped pursuing the things of God. Their, their, their growth was no longer a priority in their life. And it is to them that, 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 that the writer of Hebrews is writing. They should have been eating solid food, but like an infant, they were, they were living on milk, not pursuing that which brings strength and wholeness and fullness of health. Look at them in contrast to, to the, the, the ones who were on solid food. It says, look, that the ones who are on solid food, they have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice. I like that. Kind of like these guys, they wore a cape, right? This is what it sounds like, right? He says, look, they, the mature ones, they have their powers of discernment trained. How? By constant practice to distinguish good from evil. In other words, their spiritual growth was not a once in a while kind of a thing. Their spiritual growth was a constant practice. It was something that was a priority to them. It was something that they were intentional about. It's something that they pursued after. It was a constant practice. And look what it did. It helped them to discern between good and and evil. Their constant practice is what guarded them against error. And there was a lot of error going on in the church then, and I've got to tell you, there's a whole lot of error going on in the world today. Look at them in contrast to the milk drinkers. The milk drinkers he describes as unskilled in the word of righteousness. He's like, you know what, this idea, they don't need, they don't, he says, since he is a child. In other words, like a child, they're still trying to figure out who they are. They're unskilled in the word of righteousness. Interesting, he's saying, you should be able to teach people this stuff, but you don't even know it for yourself. You've been around it. You should be teachers, you should be influencers, you should be the one leading other people. You should be at that point of follow me, but you're not, you're still in help me mode. You're still waiting for the bottle to be handed over to you. Now there's been a lot, there's been a lot of discussion over the years as to what qualifies as milk and what qualifies as solid food. If you've been around with the church any length of time, you, you, you've run into those people who are like, oh, I've got something really meaty. Not everybody can understand it, but I do. Right? And see, usually what, what some people dis, define as solid food is a pet peeve that they have, something that's really important to them, like, like eschatology, something that the church has not been able to figure out in 2,000 years, but this guy does. He's got it all penned. He knows the date, the time, the location. He's got it all. He knows who the Antichrist is. He knows who the mother is. And he knows what their favorite meal is. Right? They've got this, set, this special track. And see, for them, they define the deep things of God as solid food because it's a pet peeve of them. Maybe their pet peeve is, is the spiritual gifts. I love that. The distortional, the distorted view on the spiritual gifts in the American church is horrible. But there's those who love to say, ah, you know what, I've got the inside track. You know, God's kind of showed me, here's what the text says, but really, ready? Here's what it really means. And they begin to spiritualize the text to suit their narrative. That's not what, what the apostle Paul, but, they, but we do, we see this, we see these opinions so not wanting to lack in presenting my own opinion, I will present my own opinion as well. What is the difference between milk and the solid food that Paul is referring to? In my opinion, the solid food that leads to maturity is the teaching that causes us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and follow Jesus. The solid food is the teaching that causes us to recognize who we are in Christ. Recognize our nature, our new nature in Christ. And then best reflect that nature in the world around us. 
Listen, the solid food of the word is not a deeper understanding on what's not clear in the scripture. That's what many people have concluded the solid food is. That solid food is a deeper understanding of what's not really clear in the scripture. Let me present this truth to you. If you take this passage and connect it over here and throw it into Daniel and you put it over here in Exodus and weave it into Genesis, but make sure you use the right translation and and just kind of like, here's the truth. No, The, the, the solid food, the deep things of God are not a deeper understanding of what's not clear. Listen. It's a deeper understanding and application of what is clear in the scripture. God did not give us a mystery book. He's presented truth for us to apply to our lives and live out. And listen, when we, when we truly live out the call of Jesus Christ, then you know what? We are simply, we, we are out of the picture. It's Jesus who is left behind. It's Jesus who's highlighted. It's Jesus' personality that influences and impacts and, and, is, and is remembered. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to go on this journey together, pursuing maturity. How do we pursue maturity? By intentionality. We must purpose in our hearts to do that. It's got to be something that's important to us. Number two, by prioritizing it. By, by, we're going to look at how do, we, how do we identify those things in our life that gets in the way that distracts me from pursuing Jesus. And how do I determine whether that's something that needs to be removed out of my life or something that needs to have some healthy boundaries so that at least it's out of the way enough so that I can see Jesus clearly. We're going to do that by demonstrating and and recognizing our need for humility. Because humility is not a default setting. Have you figured out? We're going to do that by embracing community. By seeing how we creatively can continue to grow together, whether we do that in one room or whether we do that any other means possible. We're going to be creative on how do we do that. We're going to do that by allowing that that desire to flow out of a heart of love and not out of religious obligation. Recognizing it is not our sacrifices that God is looking for, but it's our heart that God wants. And you know, one of the best ways to pursue spiritual maturity is to pursue God through his written word. You cannot, you will not grow as a Christian if you do not have a regular time in God's word. It's just not, it is your bread, it is your food, it is your sustenance. And many of you know, we've been talking about just, I figured out this is a great time to kind of remind you, we've been talking about this Immerse um, program, for lack of a better word. It's really, what is it? It's just an opportunity for us as a church family to read through the scriptures cover to cover over a period of time. Nothing magical about this particular version, this particular book. You can certainly read your own Bible. You don't need to engage with us as a group. If you're going to do it, that's great. But, but for some, there's others, a lot of people who said, you know, I, I really, you know, I'd love to be a part of something that I've got, I've got some accountability. I know specifically what to read and I'm reading it with my church family. It's not too late to sign up. I don't think we have many or any more books left. Um, we bought, we bought uh, at least a hundred of those, but you can go to our website. You could sign up. There's a link there to get the book. You can put it on Kindle or Apple Books or whatever, whatever works for you. But I would really encourage you to, to continue this journey of spiritual maturity by, by prioritizing your time in the Word of God. And what a great way to do this as we're starting tomorrow, March 1st, which how many are excited tomorrow's March 1st, by the way? I mean, how great is that? You know, the following week is Daylight Savings Time. Yeah, and that three weeks after that is like Easter, right? So, so isn't that special? It's like we're, we're moving in a good direction. Next week, we're going we're to pick up looking at Philippians chapter 4 and highlighting this idea of pursuing maturity. And I pray that the Holy Spirit takes what I've said and um, cuts through the stuff that's me, but brings to you the things that God wants you to hear so that, that you'd be encouraged today that you'd be inspired to to passionately follow Jesus, 
that you not feel like you've got this laundry list of things you've got to do, but that you'd see the opportunity, the table that's set before you to grow into the fullness of what God designs for us to be. Father, thanks for your word. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, it's in your word that you reveal for us everything that you want us to know about you on this side of eternity. And Father, I just pray that as we, as we begin this journey of, of, of maturity together, um, Lord, we get more focused on, on where we need to grow and less focused on other, where other people need to grow. Help us, Lord, to approach you with humble hearts so that we might hear your voice, that we might follow your lead, and that, Lord, that we might make you proud. It's in Christ's name we pray.